like uh, it's a real great pleasure in being asked to share this uh, session this uh, by Dr. Akali and all that. And uh, I'm especially encouraged by the, the, the level of panelists who have been selected. Today we have on our panel, uh, Mr. Timjin Toy, the Chief Secretary of Nagaland. And then we have uh, <clears throat> Romel, who will be uh, our, our Nado, who is the mayor of Kosagan in Philippines. Uh, will be sharing with us about all the things that he has done for uh, how the uh, insurgents and other things have been brought to the, uh, to the farming. Then above all, we have uh, the panelists from Bhutan, Ms. Kesang. It's a real pleasure to have you over here. And further, uh, we have with us again, Dr. Yadav, a very big uh, name in India. We are really grateful to have him on board and then to, to be our mentor, mentoring this uh, session. Is uh, I'll be introducing them later as they come in to speak. And uh, <clears throat> as I said, uh, it, it, it's quite a, it turned out to be quite a big session and I would like to congratulate NOK for having organized this uh, uh, webinar. This is the fourth in the series that they've done so far. And I think that all the sessions, uh, it has is, it is added to the, uh, the, the, to the, 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 the um, uh, organic cultivation movements in uh, Nagaland and in, around the country. And I'm sure that uh, the, during this period of lockdown, people have learned to log in into webinars and learn from each other. And then they've taken full advantage of this to uh, broadcast about the good things about the uh, organic farming. <clears throat> I am particularly happy with uh, Dr. Akali and then the NOK team who have uh, worked hard to get all this is going. And uh, it is an important thing because organic farming, the value addition part is one aspect. Farmers in places like Nagaland, Mizoram, and all the hill states of the, of the of uh, Northeast India, they are already doing organic, but uh, we have a little problem with certification and cooperation and all those kind of things. And then the link up with the organic, uh, the, the, the proper marketing systems that are yet to take its roots. We hope that the speakers will get to a light on this because the subject is organic farming policy and advocacy. And uh, uh, we will look forward to learning more about how to evolve this certain policies and movements by which uh, we can link up markets with mm -hmm. the, produ uh, the, the production centers. That is the only uh, the, 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 the area where I think uh, a lot of uh, concentration requires to be done. And um, <clears throat> the other area of the uh, organic cultivation, which we are talking about, relates to climate change, the dangers of uh, the, the globe going off haywire, and how important it is for people to realize uh, us going back to the, field, to the field without chemicals. Organic farming has been here with us only about, uh, probably say, 50, 60 years. Uh, uh, in organic farming, I mean, use of chemicals. Before that, mankind has been doing without chemicals for ages past. Mankind has survived. And although the population is growing, we may have to uh, think of new ways in which we can bring back mankind's farming to organic cultivation. Uh, and uh, you know, for our own survival. And with those things in mind, I'm really happy that the, the speakers have uh, spared their valuable time. I know all of you are busy people and you're coming to uh, participate in this uh, session. And therefore I will now open up and I'll now request our Chief Secretary of Nagaland, Sri Tamjan Toy, to kindly uh, take the field. He's a renowned bureaucrat one of the most respected bureaucrats in Nagaland, and a lot of things depend on him. Presently, he's under a lot of pressure. I will not tell the political history or the administrative history that's going on in Nagaland at the moment, 
but uh, despite the tensions around him and the political dramas that are unfolding, he's spent, he gives time for us to be on this uh, forum. And we're really grateful to have him here and I'll keep the time to him. Uh, Timjan, please carry on. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I do hope I am uh, audible to everybody. Uh, first of all, I must thank the Naga Organic Connect for organizing this seminar. I am indeed, I feel uh, extremely privileged to be part of this uh, webinar. And uh, like I was saying in the beginning, when we were introducing ourselves, I am here more as a listener. I'd rather be on listening watch rather than try and, uh, you know, preach or talk about organic farming. But as it were, you know, organic farming, we have a very uh, similar history to that of Bhutan, as uh, Ms. Kesang was uh, mentioning a little earlier. By default, we are, uh, we, we, our farming is organic. But then the present day organic farming with all its criteria and things, um, criterias which need to be fulfilled, standards that have to be met. So these are uh, things that we need to look at. And I'm so grateful that we have highly eminent um, panelists here. I'm eagerly waiting to hear from you and uh, help us with takeaways from this webinar so that this can help boost uh, organic farming in Nagaland. In Nagaland, we have been talking about organic produce, organic farming for uh, quite a few years now. But then unfortunately, because of the perception, differences in perception on organic farming, you know, you look at the farmers, just like in Bhutan, many of the farmers say, we are, we are already organic, we don't have to do much. Then there are people, the modern farmers, the uh, more um, enterprising farmers who want to meet up with the, all these standards of organic farming. So we are working at a pretty wide spectrum of different types of farmers where we need to actually uh, channel them towards making the state organic. There are some states in India who have declared themselves as organic state. We are not doing that. We, we would like to go step by step. Firstly, by um, promoting organic farming as a value addition to you know, whatever is grown here, and also its relevance to um, the food safety and the sustainable agricultural system. Our resources are not much. Our areas are not much. So our, our, um, one of the objectives is to actually increase our farmers' income. And that would happen if all of them resorted to uh, organic farming. And, um, you know, Dr. Yadav is here, thanks to him, the brainchild of the MOVCD program in India. And uh, we have been implementing that. But then I see that, uh, you know, different agencies, both uh, individuals and from the private sector and the different uh, government departments, they have been taking up various uh, um, actions, following up various action plans to promote organic uh, farming in Nagaland, and especially so with the uh, introduction of MOVCD. But my observation as a layman would be that these are all happening in isolation. I mean, there's no comprehensive thing and the results are not very visible as yet. We would not like that to happen. We would like to put it in a more, in a clearer perspective so that, uh, you know, organic farming takes deep roots in Nagaland. Talking of the different departments of the state, I mean, the different departments, for example, the MOVCD, this is being implemented by the agriculture and the horticulture department and uh, independent of each other. So uh, we would like to see a more concerted and more focused approach to organic farming so far as, uh, so far as uh, government inputs are concerned. And also there are private uh, 
enterprising farmers who are also doing their own bit and admirably so, I must say, but then the results are not visible because they are very small in number. So um, I look forward to actually learning a lot from this webinar today, from the experiences of um, the Philippines, though uh, Mr. Uh, Romel is yet to join us from Bhutan and from, the, from uh, Dr. Yadav and Sandeep and everybody else to help us. All Nagaland needs, and that is my observation, and I don't think I'll be very wrong in saying this, that uh, organic farming is already happening in a very scattered and disorganized manner. All we need to give is a big push from the government of, uh, from the government side. And uh, we are also ready with a draft of our own organic policy. Uh, this was uh, drafted with the help of the GIZ, the German Development Bank. And I'll be happy to share copies of this with our panelists. And I would be very extremely grateful if you could give your feedback so that we can make it a very, um, uh, you know, a very um, a strong policy so far as Nagaland is concerned. And at the end of this webinar, I am very confident that uh, we will go back with a lot of new insights, with a lot of new, uh, I mean, with the rich in the experiences of many of the panelists here. And uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm here on Listening Watch. Thank you very much. And I look forward to attending this. Thank you, Tanjan. Uh, as usual, your simple but insightful talks are always uh, beneficial for all. And then the, you are following the organic uh, movement in Nagaland closely. And uh, we're grateful for the, the ideas and the things that you've shared. And I agree with you, we are more or less on listening watch, wanting to learn what the other people are doing in other parts of the world. And uh, we'd uh, like to thank you, and I hope you'll be staying on. And then the, some of the other officers also, I think they're joining in, in either uh, by uh, logging in. And so we will continue and pursue to uh, listen and uh, learn. So thank you, Tamjin. And now uh, we shall move on to uh, Ms. Keshang. She's from uh, Bhutan, as we all know. And uh, she's not an ordinary woman, as uh, we can see from her, you know, for the CV. She has done extensive studies. She has uh, uh, studies, and then she has even gone to New Zealand and Australia for attending her higher education. And after that, after being educated, she has not been sitting, but she has been uh, working all over Bhutan, all over, in fact, the, the, the mountain areas of uh, uh, the region of the world where she's thing, and then she's been promoting organic cultivation all over. And presently, she serves as the national program director and is a lead specialist to provide support in the uh, direction of the government flagship programs. And it's a pleasure to have her on board. The long list of her achievements will take time to, um, to uh, read out. So let us uh, suffice with uh, keeping her with us, listening to her. And now I give the time to Ms. Kesang Tomo. Kesang, are you, can you hear me? Hello, huh? can you hear me? Ah, yes, yes, we can hear you, yeah. Okay, yes, thank you, sir, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, so uh, I'm uh, very happy to be invited here to this webinar and to be able to share uh, what we are doing here in Bhutan. Uh, thank you for making me part of this uh, group today. Uh, I, uh, I will just share what I have uh, been part of and uh, what we are doing in Bhutan. Uh, it is a uh, Long story for us, but a very short story in the history of organic agriculture. 
uh, our uh, story for organic farming and the organic development started only uh, a short time ago, which is uh, officially in 2008. Uh, so we are still sort of finding our footsteps, where to do, what, where to step, where to go. So um, when we started out uh, in Bhutan, we really didn't know um, what was uh, officially defined as organic farming. And as uh, earlier uh, uh, mentioned, uh, everybody felt we were doing organic, but it was, we found as per the international definitions, we did not qualify. So then we had to make it our business to find out what it, did that really mean? What was the definition of organic farming? What was all the certification, regulations, accreditations, and all those were? And uh, those were completely uh, above our head. So, but uh, that was on one hand. The other hand was on farmers really didn't know what was organic farming. We did traditional farming, we did natural farming, but uh, nothing as defined as organic farming. And when we started out uh, experimenting in 2003, uh, people associated organic farming with uh, hippie culture uh, sort of thing. So it was uh, quite a challenging task to uh, sort of uh, even talk to people. <laughs> people felt like oh, this is something that, uh, luxurious to think about people. Uh, this is a place where we don't have uh, enough to eat. Do we have the luxury to even think about organic food, which was associated with very high premiums? So that was the sort of mindset we had to work with and uh, start with uh, chipping away at uh, how to change the mindset. So uh, mainly it was because uh, although the use of agrochemicals in Bhutan was really, really low, it was uh, hardly anything at all, but uh, with the agriculture development in the country, it had sort of uh, started introducing fertilizers and pesticide in key food crops and cash crops around the country, which were minimal, but quite, uh, quite uh, in, uh, spread out in uh, progressive farming areas. So the thing we had to do was how do we challenge, take this challenge of uh, convincing people to change over, again, to convince people to change over, we had to have a good, good alternative. So to have a good alternative, Mainly it is the inputs, the technology, the science had to be organized. So when we ourselves were not uh, educated enough to uh, support the farmers, we had to start learning our, our uh, relearning everything. Our staff had to you know, understand uh, the science of soil, the ecosystem, how agroecology works, the interrelatedness of the uh, biodiversity and the ecosystem in our uh, uh, countries. So that basically uh, was uh, starting from uh, ground zero and seeing, looking at what we really need to do if we want to make an impact and try to move forward. So when we started looking at that, uh, we found without a policy document, we really can't do much. And we did not have a policy document. Even now we do not have a written policy document. We have a national organic uh, framework, which we use as the guiding principle for agriculture development. And following that, we basically outlines if we are to uh, go for organic development. And if we try to, uh, as a vision that was set, to be organic wholly, um, the whole country to become organic, there's so many things to be done, research, extension, training, uh, participation of the people, the staff, um, technology development, input organization, market organization, uh, farmers production organization. So the whole value chain had to be organized. In order to do that, if we do not have a policy, uh, it was not going to happen. Especially so when uh, our government system changed, from our uh, old uh, 
system of monarchy where the uh, our king we had a king with the ministers then we changed to democracy when we changed to democracy our plan was uh, dependent on five year plans with every government change we never know what will happen in the next five years whether the next government will be willing to continue so that became a new challenge as well so but uh, still we uh, the ministry of agriculture uh, considered the flagship uh, as a, the most recent program to take up and to push the framework uh, forward which means the flagship is said by just moving on as a day to do day regular business is not going to get far so the past government and the, the new government uh, both uh, luckily supported us that uh, we uh, are giving a, given an opportunity in this five year plan or to a five year plan to go out and do whatever we can to promote and develop organic agriculture so uh, for now what we are doing is um, with that uh, we are really focusing on organizing even if we can't produce uh, for export, how can we organize our own food production, import replacement, organizing consistent, re reliable input systems, which is organic fertilizers, organic seeds, biopesticides, animal feed, and our local food production as well. And uh, other thing is to uh, look at um, how can we, once we have the seeds, then we are hoping farmers will, uh, with the readily available inputs, they will take up uh, organic farming. But again, when you do uh, farm, where do you sell? The market is going to be uh, very important. So uh, the next challenge is organizing the market, uh, where and how these products are going to be sold. So marketing for organic production with certification, certification for export, ex certification for international market, as well as our own domestic market, which really doesn't need third party certification. So for our own market, uh, domestic market, we have a system uh, called local organic assurance system, which is a, a government run supervised uh, uh, assurance system, which is a slightly like a modified PGS it's not a full PGS because it is not peer reviewed. So we have our agriculture extension officers in every block who supervise the production as well as monitor and certify and verify the production system. And that is uh, finally approved by the National Organic Program. And um, other thing is uh, looking at how we can expand the market within the country itself. So the farmers have a market access which is uh, setting up more organic sales outlets in every district and looking at uh, uh, producing some products on a uh, little higher volume so we can try to, uh, if not export it to third countries, at least try to link up with the markets in India and neighboring countries like maybe Bangladesh, India and our Northeast uh, states as well. So these are some of our, because our productions are so low, not so big, uh, market will not really meet the uh, big global markets. So we are looking at either trading between uh, and within our region or even forming, uh, maybe even joining a consortium of the Northeast and uh, Himalayan countries production system so that we could even have a, a sort of a consortium of uh, labels which we could uh, come up with the volume so hopefully something like with that, this will come up in the future. But for now, we are really looking at small bits and pieces and getting ourselves organized, our farmers organized into production groups and certifying. And uh, next is uh, looking at also how can we engage more people in organic farming? We have a challenge and we are trying to engage at least 35,000 people uh, in organic farming. And mostly we want to engage with unemployed youth and women who are out there who do not have an income, who are not employed. And even many more have been unemployed now with the COVID. So we, with the organic flagship, we have been 
supporting many project proposals which are going into organic production, urban agriculture, production for vegetables, uh, even cereal crops, and farm development by helping people to develop uh, land, uh, you know, revival of fallow land. So through these uh, programs, we are uh, also organizing how research can support these uh, uh, farmers with uh, solutions for problems, uh, trying to uh, generate technology. Of course, we cannot generate a lot of technology. We are not that, uh, uh, we don't have so much resources, but borrowing ideas from our neighbors and similar situations, uh, borrowing appropriate tools and equipments that uh, people are using in other countries, uh, and also trying to link up and network with uh, similar countries so that we can learn from others because uh, we don't have the capacity to uh, invent uh, and reinvent uh, ideas and wheels, but uh, we can definitely learn from neighbors and we can learn from other people who have gone through this before us. Uh, so we really um, uh, working on this in, in small steps Eventually, we hope we will get there, and uh, maybe time will be different. We will take more time than we thought we would take. And uh, so in 2020, it is not going to happen. That doesn't matter. We are still headed that way. So we are hoping that maybe uh, in another uh, 20 years, maybe, may, even if it's 10, 15, depends on how our uh, Farmers will take it up, how business uh, opportunities will open up with the markets. Because uh, what we see is as long as markets are built, as long as uh, there is good uh, uh, place to sell, we don't really have to people push people to grow. People will grow. Uh, but uh, main thing is we have to provide the market, market space, linkages, outlets, as well as the assurance and the guarantee system which is the organic certifications. And uh, we feel uh, third party certification for international is maybe not required for all the farmers. Uh, they only need uh, for uh, export. So we are focusing a lot on local organic assurance systems, whereby we our farmers can trade and supply food to the local markets. And hopefully we can work on regional understanding mutual agreements and uh, neighbor sharing organic food so that in the northeast uh, with the northeast india or uh, indian market if we can access that will be a big um, enough space for us but nice because we are such a small country and uh, that has been a good indication for us in bhutan when um, Earlier in the year, uh, ICCI and BCCI organized a meeting that there may be possibilities that uh, our uh, these products could also go to some of the Indian uh, supermarket shops would be, I think, uh, more than enough for us. But again, we would again look forward to creating connections with other countries because uh, we feel everybody, if we can share and uh, 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 the good food or good products with other countries beyond our own region is uh, has much uh, more beauty as well so that everybody can uh, appreciate uh, other organic countries uh, hard work and uh, what we produce so these are some of the things uh, we are doing so currently we are engaged a lot in developing, uh, supporting new proposals, new uh, farmers, groups, youth, women coming into organic farming. So we, uh, we are very grateful for this opportunity from our government now. So for now, uh, for, till, for the 12 five year plan, we are in the second year now. So for uh, till 2023, we have been given 1 billion neutrum. So that is quite a significant amount for us to work on organic farming. So we are happy to uh, be uh, managing that program. So our we are a small office here, but we work through our, our research centers in the country and our district agriculture officers. And we are engaging all the interested farmers to start with um, farm foti uh, soil fertility management, 
crop health management, growing a crop that they can sell, and then they uh, food diversity in the household so that they can meet their own food security. And then uh, they, they don't have to rely on buying food from outside. So that is the approach we are taking. And then we are pushing a lot on uh, building compost, uh, compost sheds, compost structures, and because we feel if people have the soil organized and the basic plant health management organized, then most of the problems on the farm are solved. And then our challenge is to look at, look out for markets, value chains and logistic organizations, assurance system, uh, certifications, and promoting that uh, brand, uh, the organic brand is, unless people recognize it, they see it as something different, that they see the benefit of uh, um, eating organic, in our country, you may be in many of our Asian countries, is people do not really differentiate organic from local. Organic and local is considered the same. Our challenge is are we organic certified products are much better than local food. So it is plus plus. So this is a marketing edge we have to take. And uh, uh, we are trying to promote the organic mark, Bhutan organic mark as better superior than local organic local food that is uh, that if you use the Bhutan organic logo it is a plus plus point you are 100% assured it has been grown organically so this is what we are doing uh, and hopefully we are of course uh, before the end of these uh, next few years we are also hoping that we can actually put in a written policy uh, so that a policy is uh, written and then endorsed by the parliament we don't have one now so unless we have one we do not uh, ensure there is continuity but if we have a document which is written as a policy then once the policy is put in place any government come and go the policy stays in place so it'll ensure that the new government that comes after uh, this will also continue to support organic farming so we are on the process of looking at writing a policy, developing a policy that will have to, uh, has to pass through the parliament. So we are working on that. Thank you. Thank you, Kisang. That's a real eye opener for us. And like in Bhutan, actually Nagaland also mm -hmm. is facing the, almost the same dilemmas. You know, we have this uh, issue of how to start the whole uh, organic program. We've been discussing about it. Then we also think that <laughs> sometimes that the organic farming is a luxury in view of the food issues that we have to uh, look after for the people. And then, especially we don't have a part of the policy document on organic uh, cultivation. The policy document has been framed, has been written, but uh, we are yet to actively adopt it. And so I think we can share our uh, experiences on all this. And actually, I don't really know whether many countries have uh, policies on organic cultivation. Uh, they don't mm -hmm. see many countries having these policies and therefore maybe the lead which Bhutan has taken, uh, which we will try to follow Nagaland and others who could perhaps be a kind of a lead for uh, many parts of the country. We are happy that you slowly but steadily you are headed that way. That's what you have said, and then uh, we, that's very encouraging for us. And um, you have uh, mentioned about the regional understanding amongst uh, the organic practitioners of both Bhutan and then uh, our Northeast. Uh, I think uh, that is a very important aspect which we have to really build up uh, the, uh, the the regional uh, understanding. So on that note, we shall go on further. Uh, we would like to thank you for the very you know, the clear, precise uh, way in which you have stated what you are doing in Bhutan, and that we have learned a lot uh, from what you have said today. And uh, for the participants, by the way, uh, if you would tap it into your questioning and answer, there is a form. So as the speaker is speaking, you can kindly give your uh, start typing your questions 
so that at the end of the sessions, we can come back to the question and answers. Uh, and uh, for the time being, we shall continue uh, with our uh, talks and discussions. And um, <clears throat> uh, we'll come to the question and answer sessions at the end of the session. So we would uh, be really grateful. We have heard a lot about uh, Bhutan, what a beautiful state it is, how you were. You have uh, control tourism, and that's the by word. Every, everywhere we discuss tourism in India, we talk about the Bhutan model. And then uh, I hope that we'll be taking up the Bhutan model as far as the organic cultivation is concerned. Now, uh, Sandeep, can you hear me, Sandeep? Yes, sir. Uh, we'll have Dr. Yadav first, or would you like me to go first? Uh, we'll, we'll have Dr. Yadav. Yeah, and, and after Dr. Yadav, I will go. Yeah, then if uh, you can also keep in touch with uh, whether you I'm, can... I'm still attempting him. There's a problem, the brownout in that area. But we are trying. I have two people in Philippines also trying. Okay. Now, uh, we shall have Dr. Yadav. I don't think he needs any introduction. He's been doing a lot of work uh, in the field of agriculture, especially in the field of uh, uh, you know, organic cultivation. He has been... Uh, uh, instrumentals in introducing the PGS, the uh, participating guarantee systems in the Indian program. And uh, he's been a guiding light as far as the organic cultivation is concerned. Recently, we know that he is the, the, the MOBCD brainchild, and we are all following behind him. So with that kind of a background, I don't think there's much need for me to uh, introduce him. Everybody knows him and that, uh, are following him. So I will now uh, thank him for coming on board. A very, very special occasion for us. Mm -hmm. And now we, I'll give the time to Dr. Yadav to share with us. Yeah, Dr. Yadav, can you continue? Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Oh, sir, first from my side, greetings. My regards to the Honorable Chief Secretary, Government of Nagaland. Regards to Mr. Zamir, Professor Kali, and all the participants there. It's great to be a part of the program from Northeast and especially the Nagaland. Uh, because the Northeast, since my almost about last 20 years, had been the close to my heart, and I have been somehow associated with this part of the country due to one or the other programs. I'd like to give a brief presentation. I hope the screen is visible to everybody. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Please go ahead. My voice is also visible. Yes, you know, both, because both. I do not know whether the screen is visible or not. Or the, it is, my it is voice visible. Is also... Both are visible. Yes. Bo uh, visible and can, we can hear you. So first thing is congratulations from my side to the organizers for organizing this wonderful session. I'll start this with a very, very good news. Uh, although his, the Romel is not here, but the Philippines recently in the month, this month, June itself, has passed a resolution in the upper house to adopt the PGS as a legal certification system in the Philippines. And with this, Philippines has become the third country in the world to have the PGS as a legalized system of the certification, authorized system in their country. That's a great news. I hope we all must applaud it and we must congratulate the government of the Philippines. Second, once this COVID is over, we all can anticipate the world is going to change. And so is the agriculture. So is the food. We anticipate that a lot of people will be 
shifting from non-veg to more towards the vegetarian food. And among the vegetarian, there will be demand for more and more of the organic food. So organic movement in the world which started with all struggling steps is now likely to leap forward. And we hope, initial estimates say, so far our growth was internationally somewhere in the range of say about 9 to 12%. But post-COVID, it is likely to be more than 15 to 20 percent. During the last four months, the sales into the European Union and the US, if they are the indication because they are the 90 percent consumer of all the organic commodities, Europe has many countries have increased their sales from 25 percent to 120 percent. And US also, the sales have increased to the tune of almost about 35 percent in some of the states. So that's a silver line that we need to march fast. We need to go ahead and see how we can make it a mainstream agriculture. Instead of a niche agri agriculture, let us concentrate to make it on a mainstream agriculture. Uh, I'll just briefly through the presentation, I'll just give a glimpse of what policy interventions in India have been taken care of, how we have progressed, what lessons we have learned, and what innovations we have introduced after learning those lessons, and we are still struggling. You know, as far as policy is concerned, in 2005, government published a small policy document, although officially it was approved by the ministry, but not adopted by the government. But still, with the changing government, organic kept on growing. In 2005, when this first policy document was revealed, our vision was to create 10% of the cultivable under organic. And I still remember many of this, my senior bosses always say, unimaginable, and you will never be able to see it in your life. <laughs> that was really interesting. We thought by 2030, we may be able to achieve 40 million, 14 million hectare. But so far, initial growth was very less. We have been struggling to keep the organic standing. And so far, by March 2020, we have been able to bring in almost about 2.8 million hectare under the certified organic farming. If we include some of the farmers, those who are not certified in the trade of the organic, it may go up to somewhere at about three and a half million hectares. And there are three important pillars, actually, which played a very crucial role, role in ensuring that organic movement moves faster. First was the quality assurance system which is being spearheaded under the National Program for Organic Production and the PGS, which was initially started by the civil society organizations and then government also came into the picture since about 2011 to 14. And now it is one of the very ambitious program of the government. And I tell you, this PGS, what we could not achieve in terms of the publicity and the promotion with different schemes having a lot of monies, we have achieved much higher proportion of the attention with this PGS because it moves the farmers from the grassroots. Second policy intervention was the extension activities through the National Center for Organic Farming and number of numerous schemes were launched by the government of India as well as also the different state governments to facilitate certification, to technology transfer, and so many other things. And simultaneously, almost parallelly, research system has also gone with us. This is a network project on organic farming research started from 2004, now it is still continuing. And almost 10 state agriculture universities have center of excellence on organic farming. We have got a national center at the Sikkim. Among different states, 14 states 
have defined process. Chief uh, Secretary, sir, I have included the Nagaland also, although it is yet to be adopted, but I have included Nagaland also in this one. Most surprising part is many of the states, they have adopted the policies, but very few states have been able to work on the policies and really implement the policy on the ground. Sikkim can be an example which had determination to convert the entire area into organic. Nagaland also, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, somewhere 10 years ago, uh, a document was visited by the government with the intention to convert the entire Nagaland to the organic. Other state government like Meghalaya also, they start their intention, but somehow the document could not be finalized. So, among the smaller states, it's mainly the Sikkim who realized the vision and they benefited also with it, not only in terms of the ecology or in terms of the environment, soil and water, but they were most benefited in terms of the tourism. You know it very well, everybody knows Sikkim is the now second highest per capita income state. and the major income from the for the state is from the tourism. Now these are some of the institutional development graphical form you can say what we have started over the years. I need not to go into the details. They are for quality assurance, for extension support schemes, for marketing and then research. Initially when we started the organic farming movement, quality assurance was the prime and that was one of the reasons ki why majority of the people in the initial year used to think organic farming means certification and certification means organic farming. A, okay, misconception could develop because organic farming started with it. But with the extension and the other schemes, things kept on changing, research kept on consolidating our hands in terms of the technology and getting the good yields. Marketing part has come up very recently where we have realized that without connecting the organic farmers to the market, we will not be able to sustain the movement for long. In today's world, ultimately it's the economics, which is the driver. So these are the, you can say five major milestones for policy interventions, which actually shape the entire organic agriculture movement in India. First was the launching of national program. It was a certification system under Epida Ministry of Commerce. Then of late in 2011 to 14, it was another system came participatory guarantee system. Then a series of institutions were created in the form of a net national center, net network project, then center of excellence. Finally, the no free at Sikkim. Then government of India has put a plot of money and the efforts and time in development of the clusters and strengthening the domestic and export industry. And with MOVCD, we have entered into a new phase. Now, a lot of learning was done, a lot of lessons were realized. And keeping all those in mind, the MOVCD was created. Here, the scheme is developed in such a way that a value chain infrastructure is created under the ownership of the farmers. Where the farmers who are doing the good ecological service to the state and to the nation, they also get benefited by direct marketing. Otherwise, everybody knows in our country, we have got a long chain of the middlemen. A product purchased at the two rupees from the farmer is sold into the market at 25 rupees a kg. So we thought ki if we can create even if some small models where farmer themselves can take up the entire responsibility on their hand and move forward to reaching to the consumers, I think that will be the best future of the country. Now, during this one, when we studied these policies which different states have drafted, there were some common features. Everybody has accepted this year, yes, soil health, environment pollution, resource depletion. They are problems. The, every state has a desire to address the problems. Organic agriculture 
somehow accepted that yes, it can be a viable approach. There still can be a people those who can contest the claim or those who may not agreeing with it. But still, okay, they also say at least it's one of the solutions. Then many state governments have shown willingness to tune the policies which suit the organic movement. They also search for the options to develop organic institutions. ready to adopt organic systems in phased manner with commodity and area specific approach this is what i am talking about the oecd efforts to set up farms institutions and bring them to the markets and developing them into the value chain now during this one what are the lessons which we learned and how now based upon these lessons we are prioritizing our future skills first thing what we could realize that all farmers may be starting from northeastern to the down south up to the tamil nadu and top north up to the punjab and haryana all farmers they are willing to adopt organic farming and those who adopt it they really feel pride in saying yes i am an organic farmer but the question problem is nobody is willing to compromise the productivity we still lack lot of technological innovations which can ensure that organic can also give all the resources we can have the same amount of productivity but actually doesn't happen on to the farm another problem which we realize ki thinly distribution of clusters over a large area actually that defeats the entire purpose that is happening everywhere i am bringing it to the notice of our chief chief secretary also sir whenever we define a scheme and entrust the task of implementation to the states what happens the program goes to the state they will take that program divided by the district divided by the blocks and thinly distributed across the state now this defeats the entire what you can say the mandate and the object if such a small small clusters are spread over the entire area of the state with no connectivity in between them it will be very difficult to link them to the market now how with this learning we have changed. 2004 to 10 our main focus was mainly to facilitate the certification for exports at that time organic was only export driven a industry which was needed only for the exporters from 2010 to 15 sustainability ecological services those came into the focus building soil health and fertility but 2016 onwards a issue doubling of farmers income empowerment of farmers with this one we have tried to give a different type of shape to the organic agriculture movement and i think the first pilot in the form of mobcd was started in the northeastern regional nowadays these are the two schemes one is the paramparagat krishi vikas yojana which is applicable in all the mainland states and another is shan organic value chain which is applicable into the northern northeastern states these are these two state schemes which are actually spearheading the organic movement lot of financial allocations have been done recently we have also included the natural farming i think many of you might have heard about the zero budget natural farming or low budget natural farming or no cost natural farming they also organic so we have included those farming systems also into the ambit of the organic farming we have also started giving certain support to the natural farming systems and one more thing was that individual farmers and the large contiguous areas which were not under organic although they were organic by all means we have also launched recently only two days ago we have sent the guidelines to all the states that now the states if they want and if they are confident that large contiguous area is traditionally organic and there is no chemical input usage history you can convert them the entire area and mass into the organic and can offer the farmers of those area a premium market now coming back northeastern region 
I hope many of you may be remembering that Prime Minister announced it from the Red Fort that we will be developing a commercial organic farming and making the northeastern region as a hub for organic farming. So MOVCD was the, you can say, outcome child of that vision which started in the northeastern region. Now goals, I think you all belong to northeast, you know very well. Uh, basically it was to develop concentrated clusters, convert them into the FPOs, provide the entire value chain infrastructure, and then link to the market. Our Honorable Chief Secretary, sir, was saying that it's a good scheme, but somehow we have not been able to achieve the real, you know, goal out of that. Reason is, first thing is that whenever any scheme comes, we thinly distribute it. That's one of the major reasons of achieving low results. Another thing is, you know, all these schemes of agriculture ministry or the departments are implemented by our agriculture and horticulture departments. And these departmental officers are basically trained for ensuring the increased production, ensuring good quality inputs, ensuring delivery of the subsidies. But they are not so confident in creating new chains, processing, and linking them to the markets. Also, the technology transfer, very little is known among these officers of the different departments. So, although it was across the country, we have no other option. We have started with them. And I hope things are getting changed and we can go ahead in the future with much more energy. Now, with this MOVCD, what was our target? First, young and innovative farmers in the rural areas who can really understand the organic and the importance of organic and who can put energy and innovation on that. Then marketable commodities, every area has got some specific commodities, let us concentrate on them. And what we did, it, we, we said, ki, it's not necessary that you bring 100% of the area under the marketable commodity. You bring almost 50%. 50% area, you keep it for local consumption. 50%, you cover it for marketable commodities. And to reach to the market, we also have to be sure that production must be of international quality. And what market demands? In what shape it demands? In what packaging it demands? To ensure a good return, local value addition, is very important and to support that rural enterprises in the form of anything can be there they are very important and once we have all these things in shape goal oh, just i am saying this is Something wrong, with, something wrong with the audio system. Uh, now, actually, this in, nowadays internet is always a problem. Yeah, now it's okay. Now it's okay. Yeah. No, I, I shifted the Wi Fi <laughs> device very closer to my computer. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, this is about the Northeast. You, you know, every state is doing very good. And I, I'm really very happy to share. You know, we are implementing the MOVCD program in all the eight states. And I think whenever it comes to the you know, telling the people about the success we achieve, we normally talk about the two states. They are the Nagaland and Manipur. Uh, still, okay, we may not have been able to achieve 100% out of this scheme what we, were, what we have envisioned. But still, these two states have really worked very good. And we hope with the same amount of enthusiasm and you can say blessings of the leadership, uh, we can consolidate whatever we have achieved. And maybe by the end of third phase, we may bring in more synergy, more output, and more national and international attention. You can see these are some of the brands which have been developed and created by these Northeastern 
So on top you can say Naga Organic. These are some of the infrastructure you can see. In money, actually, the entire program is led by the women entrepreneurs. Uh, almost half of the value addition and processing facilities are driven by the women entrepreneurs. This is about the processing unit in the Nagaland, which have been developed. This is both are in Dimapur. One is of the spices, one is another is of the pineapple. These are some of the local outlets which have been opened into the Nagaland. So I hope with these policies, uh, things have moved forward. We have uh, gone to certain extent from simply promoting organic agriculture for sustainability for the local market, and then again for the exports. Now we are growing ahead for organized markets. And one very interesting issue, which I could also feel during this uh, lockdown period, that it is the organic farmers which have taken up the responsibility on their heads to ensure that the Customers keeps on getting the fresh fruits and vegetables, that two of the organic, to the customers. Uh, we have got a lot of uh, photographs and a lot of success stories from Manipur, from Nagaland, from Mizoram. And we have also seen in other states also, even, even with the help of the farmer, we have been able to start a vegetable, organic vegetable supply chain into the Delhi with the outlet. Uh, in one outlet in Prashibhavan, one outlet in New Mutibag, one outlet in Kudko Place, one outlet in what you can say, GK, GK, GK2, and similarly at seven more places. So the crisis has also brought, and this crisis, in this crisis, this innovative organic farmers, they really came out outstandingly. And they spread the message, yes, they are there in the need of the crisis. They are not able to help ensure the essential supplies, but they also ensure that you get a good quality organic food material, which can give you an immunity to tide over the crisis. And that is how, what I feel the energy and the enthusiasm, what has been grown over the years, and specially accelerated during this period, will sustain its momentum, continue. And we hope in the country, our exports are likely to grow by minimum, I tell you 25% to 30% in the next five years. And our domestic market will be growing much faster, maybe at the rate of 25 to 30% or maybe more than that. And that is indicative of a bright future and bring in the responsibility from all of us to ensure that we do not miss the opportunity. We harvest on it, put our hands together, keep all the growers together in the front and the market forces to ensure that consumers get this good, healthy, safe food for their best food. Thank you very much, sir. Jameer, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, the most enlightening thing, uh, taking your time, actually we felt very guilty even to ask you to participate. But uh, you have condescended to be with us and at the same time shared so much valuable information, which uh, you know, sort of really is a motivational thing for us to have you on the board. Uh, you have forward on many, many points. And uh, well, congratulations, your Philippines having accepted the PGS system. I think it, the, the credit will go to you. And then your indication that the world is going to change 
is post covid uh, that is uh, the thing which we have also been talking about with all uh, we have not been able to articulate or to you know make it clear in what way this change and you have made it very clear that uh, and i agree with you that we may have a, a shift towards vegetarianism and also that vegetarianism would uh, would link up with uh, uh, with organic and uh, you know the, for, for better food and other systems and i think that is a very important issue which we will have to first uh, continue discussion here in nagaland and uh, all of the many other points which i think the uh, the, the, the listeners and participants have learned uh, i would i'll not go into all the details they have already learned but i'm really grateful to for you for highlighting the achievements been made in nagaland and uh, as uh, bhutan has said slowly but steadily we'll keep on moving towards uh, the objective of making things organic and for which we have to thank you for your guidance and uh, we will hope you will continue to stay on when the next uh, question and answers session comes on after the next uh, speaker now i'm here with you for full time sir Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Now, um, Sandeep, uh, are you on the uh, on the line? Can yeah, I'm, I'm here, sir. I'm here. Sandeep. Can you see me? Can you see me? I'm also on camera. Yes, we can see you. Yeah, I, we can see you. Yeah. So, uh, Romal is still not no, available. No, no, there is a brownout. I'm not able to reach him in his area. Yeah, we are get, we are getting a call from Vic in Philippines that there's a huge heavy downpour going on in the in the oh. in the, the Philippines at the moment. Yeah, they and have the, they have many typhoons. They must uh, be affecting bandwidths and they are affecting yeah. these electrical connections. So, uh, can you fill up for? Yeah, uh, I, I have the two presentations. Okay. Not as good as him, but I will try, sir. I will try. Yes, so please, yeah, please, yeah, yeah. Thank you, so, thank you, uh, Sir Alam, and uh, uh, thank you, Honorable Chief Secretary, for making the time. It's uh, very special for us to have you and uh, Dr. Yadav, who's been a kind of mentor for us. You know, he's my go-to resource for. Uh, all questions on organic or certification or research, really the whole facet. So I'm very honored uh, and and proud to be with uh, such uh, dignitary. So I will just start uh, two programs uh, from uh, Mayor Romel. And uh, one, uh, we start with what is called the Arms to Farms, which was uh, very interested uh, for Nagaland's perspective. And there is uh, Mayor Romel's picture there. He is the mayor of uh, Kaswagan uh, municipality in Lana del Norte province in the Mindanao uh, area, the southern part of the Philippines. Uh, and he has been very recognized by many awards for this uh, scheme of his, which he calls the Arms to Farms uh, program. And uh, uh, so that's uh, one of the prizes which he got in the, the United uh, Local Governments Council, which met in Bogota in Colombia. He got the first prize for for this program called Arms to Farms. And, and he made a statement there that every conflict starts with really poverty and, and hunger. And also last year he was, uh, when Sikkim got the first prize for the Future Policy Award, World Future Council, he, he got an honorable mention for his work in Kaswak. And uh, there's a history of uh, violence in the Philippines, especially the Southern Philippines. And you know we heard also a month ago where there was another attack in the, in the Mindanao part where there were the Muslim rebels um, uh, fighting for land and, and that was the problem also in Kaswagan. Uh, Mayor Rommel uh, took over uh, in 2010 and uh, this, this kind of small uh, insurgency has been going on there since 2000 and President Estrada then had even declared a kind of a war on these places. So the challenges they, they saw was uh, food security because uh, many of these rebels had uh, no land access, they had lost their land. And there was the issue of poverty and, and hunger and also livelihood. So they, they found that that was one of the reasons uh, for them to take up arms. And uh, what were the, the challenges they had uh, was the cultural biases because this was a Hindu, uh, a Christian, Muslim uh, kind of conflict. Uh, there were a lot of natural calamities now, like you got the message from Vic, you know, there is, they have about 20 to 25 major typhoons there every year. And uh, there, plus there are earthquakes. I, I visited there about half a dozen times last year. And I've been there with a volcano eruption, with a typhoon. <laughs> so, you know, the natural calamities are almost very frequent over there. There was this armed conflict. And because of that, there was a law enforcement issue. 
Philippines is one of the countries where uh, firearms are uh, quite uh, predominant. You can uh, see even security guards in malls, they have actually real guns and, and machine guns. There was poverty, there was a drug problem, there was a culture cult, like I mentioned, a lot of uh, common crime and land dispute, you know, so there people had a lot of issues with land. And Meromel launched this Sikat Pa scheme, what he says, sustainable and integrated Kaswagan area development and peace agenda. And what that meant was to bring economic productivity, to bring an ecological balance with organic farming, economic productivity, I was mentioned already, good governance. He's been winning regularly awards from the Philippine national government for, they have a good governance award for municipalities, local governance, and he continues to win those awards. Uh, a spirituality and cultural respect. So, you know, respect for all religions. Uh, he, uh, for Muslim festivals now, especially there are special programs during Eid and uh, where people, the community is honored. Uh, a peaceful community, harmonious relationship and to ensure peace and order and make sure that the basic services are quite accessible. So this was called the Arms to Farms program where uh, he, he spoke with some of, some of them are commandos in the field. And I've been with these people many times I've uh, had meetings with them. I visited their farms, and um, you know the people who were making bombs and blowing up buildings, and uh, uh, you know using machine guns now are using tractors and and shovels and doing organic farming. Uh, so, what are some of the strategies? What he did in this arms to farms thing was first was uh, the whole uh, municipality was declared as an organic farming municipality through an ordinance. Uh, there was a school uh, for practical agriculture. This is a diploma program after the high school. They established a very good uh, demo farm as well as a tra training center there. So farmers can come and get trained over there on, on techniques as well as um, uh, buy any inputs or learn on inputs as well. Uh, there was a lot of provision for pre and post harvest facilities. Uh, one very interesting thing was most of the market, they focused on the local market. So they ensured that the farmer was able to sell all his produce in the municipality. They included that in their school meal programs. All the municipality government uh, official uh, catering was all, all from the purchase of these farmers. And they ensured that most of the produce was consumed locally. Uh, they, they expanded these communal gardens and they gave a very special focus on capacity building and technology transfer to the rebel returnees and marginal farmers. They also gave them a lot of capital. Uh, they gave a lot of them uh, sheep and, and pigs and uh, uh, cows to the animal husbandry was really done well. They had an animal breeding station. And as well as there are some in Kaswagan is also a course like in the Philippines, uh, aquaculture fisheries is quite important. Uh, some of them were given even fishing gears and many of them on their farms also, they have fish ponds. Uh, what were the goals and the objectives? They wanted to mainstreaming of the rebel returnees in society with peaceful coexistence, trust, confidence and unity. Uh, the rebel returnees then became channels for peace and to give up this culture of violence and really creating a culture of uh, peace. And there was no, there was a food security always, as well as there was a very special focus given that them and their families get education, health, along with this food security. Uh, one, it was a very holistic approach, uh, you know, the, with the capacity building, with the microfinancing, giving the product marketing, and really uh, organizing them into groups. And we'll see that a bit later with forming cohesive and effective cooperatives. And this was the result in Kaswagan in 2009, they had a 69.6 uh, poverty incidence rate. And by 2018, as a result of these policies within uh, in a short time of 10 years, they were able to bring it to 9.1%. And this is uh, the revenue collection uh, for the municipality, uh, which uh, you can also see how, how it is growing. Um, and this is uh, Commander Bravo, who's, who's in the black jacket, who's hugging me who was the, the leader of the rebels. Today is a member of parliament uh, and he's also worked very closely with uh, Mayor Omel and uh, to, to make sure that these programs uh, work. You know, Commander Bravo has been a big part in, in uh, helping in this process. And uh, these are some of the farmers who, who are now, some pictures of the farmers that they're sharing here. Yeah. So this was for about the arms to farms program, uh, which uh, uh, many people were interested to see. Also, I would like to share about a second one, which is more relevant. Uh, another policy recently launched uh, by the by the national government in the Philippines and uh, uh, very well implemented by Mayor Omel. Uh, so this this uh, policy 
I'm, I can't pronounce the words very good, so we call it the BP2, which was basically, there were a lot of returnees. Philippines, like our states of Kerala, has a very large overseas uh, population, in, primarily in the Gulf and some parts of America. So many people from the Gulf were coming back, as well as uh, main cities like Manila and Cebu had a lot of workers. And like we experienced in India, a lot of them wanted to come back uh, to their village. So the government launched a housing and livelihood opportunity scheme for returning uh, residents. And before any scheme or program is launched, they selected, uh, because of the good governance of Mayor Romel, they, they selected Kaswagan as, as one of the pilot areas to, to implement uh, the scheme. And uh, so you can see some of the pictures here, where there was, there's been land uh, allotted by the government to make this model community of people. All of these people who come back will have to take up farming as a, as a occupation. And this land was purchased through a grant from, uh, they work very closely with with CSR, because as we know, sometimes the government funds are not enough uh, or, or take some time in coming. So Meromel has been very active in working with many private uh, initiatives. So there's a power company in Kaswagan who, who donated the money to buy this uh, six hectare of land to, to build the community. And uh, this is the, the authority has uh, sanctioned a million dollars for housing and site development for this new village what they're going to bring there. And you can see the ground uh, breaking ceremony, which was held recently, I think last week, uh, where, the, where the governor and, and many dignitaries are, are there to, to launch the scheme. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a national scheme, but it's being implemented very well in, in, in Kaswagan to, to give a, a model for other places where we have now this issue of many returnees coming back. How do we create uh, uh, this is one model where you know there's a budgetary allocation to create a whole new community but the the thing which we can see very clearly from here is that um, you know uh, agriculture or fisheries have uh, where it's available is really a way for these returnees to come back and add to the to the economy uh, so meromel like uh, you heard from sir alam is now stuck in the uh, in the typhoon so uh, some questions which I can answer on his behalf, I'll be happy to do that. Otherwise, uh, uh, we can always uh, mail them to him and, and get replies to you later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandeep, <laughs> lifesaver. Mm -hmm. uh, although, yes, we have missed Romel, but uh, you have very uh, well covered the subjects which, uh, uh, which uh, you are well acquainted. You say you. You go there very often, so you must be observing. And then, um, actually, the intention was that we would uh, like to replicate what we hear in Nagaland, some of the things which we have done. And uh, they really sound very interesting. And Tamjan, uh, uh, if you are listening in, I was wanting to suggest uh, the chief secretary mm. uh, whether you can invite people like um, Romel or and Sandeep to come in to Nagaland and give the presentations to the uh, people here in this in the state so that we can you know uh, uh, try to emulate whatever has been done uh, insurgency has had its ravages on the on the people but uh, one of the ways out is to bring back people to the land and if we're bringing them back maybe the organic uh, contribution can be uh, made uh, again, uh, you can uh, enhance the organic cultivation at the same time bring peace to society i mean it would be a concept which we worth examining so uh, uh, maybe we'll ask the chief secretary to give a little comment at the end of the session but uh, i there are a lot of questions which have uh, come up, and therefore I'd like to now hand over the session to uh, our Dr. Akali, who will uh, 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 guide us through the questions that are going to be Switch it off your video. Thank you, sir, for the time. And uh, now a very important part again for the question and answer. So, uh, I would like to, first of all, uh, 
pose this question to uh, Dr. Yadav. Um, sir, there are a lot of questions, so maybe I'll go one by one. But the most important thing and uh, for which the organizer ourselves also had uh, prepared this question and uh, some of the attendee has also put up the same question. So, uh, sir, we would like to hear from you, like, uh, what will be the, what may be the uh, good initiative or the policies for Nagaland in terms of organic farming, especially in the light of uh, uh, this COVID-19 as, as well as the uh, huge returnees in our state. So there are a lot of educated, highly skilled people. So how do we bring them to organic uh, farming and enterprise? So we would like to get some, uh, you know, some uh, ideas and inputs from you, sir. Oh, you know, it's not the problem of the Nagaland. Your network, there's a little problem. We can't, uh, the audio is the uh, audio is disturbed. I'll just have a camera off TJ. If you put off the camera, it may be better. Yeah, talk without the video. No, no. Hello. 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 We can hear you, sir. We can hear you. Sir, we can hear you. Okay. Mm -hmm. From front of me, screen is gone. So I was no, going no. to what is that? So, yeah, sir. Sir, it, it is broken. We can hear you, but the, the, I think that network is something wrong. Can you shift around your your data card or something like that? I do not know what is happening. I'm oh, yeah, now it is clear. Now it is clear, sir. Now it's perfect. Ah, now, now it is clear, yes. In the direct transit. Uh, so, I actually can how we can go ahead with organic strategies. Sir. Help these guys. And also to the union. No, it's not, it is not clear yet. Uh, it is again gone back to the uh, breaking up. Another question from other panelists. Yeah. I'll Sir, come back. Yes, I think I will just uh, ask from Madam Kassin first. And in the meantime, you please try to rectify your uh, network problem. So, uh, Madam. Are you there, Madam Kessin? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. We have one question for you. Um, what, would be, what are the steps that you are planning to take for Bhutan National Organic Policies? You've already shared the different things that you have done, but what are, what are the next steps that you're planning for your national policies on organic farming? Okay. Um, one thing we are uh, now, as I shared earlier, that we are working on having a policy and uh, we'll work on that. The other thing is uh, we are working on developing uh, the uh, regulation and uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. yes, we okay. can hear you. So we are working on a regulation uh, system which will enable uh, our growers to be able to trade their products in the country as well as those who can grow on larger scale to be able to export. So export to the regional market as well as to the international market. So in order to do that, we have a lot of um, uh, work in the guarantee system, certification system, building the capacity, the system, the regulation, accreditation, and all those things are uh, underway. So we have uh, our Bhutan organic standard but now the standard if it has to be recognizable outside. It has to be accredited, put in some accredited uh, certification bodies. Uh, so we are in the process of doing that so that we can connect uh, outside the country as well so that uh, trade opens up. So that is on the one side. The other thing is on the long term to institute a, a center which will be 
uh, leading with the national mandate of organic research and development so that uh, the development of uh, organic sector will be continued after this uh, uh, short-term organic flagship program because the flagship is only for a short time, time-bound program. But the national organic program in essence, which is the uh, regulation as well as the research and extension capacity needs to go on for a longer term. So that is what we will be working on so that it doesn't end when the five-year plan ends. It can go on to the next uh, few years. Uh, I mean, not just few years, few decades after that, that it ensures it goes on for a while. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. And uh, while Dr. Yadav is still trying to rectify his problem, uh, can you also, I mean, it's, it was a kind of comment, but if you would like to say further on this, uh, some people have commented that um, regarding, instead of going the pathway of organic farming, why not build on the brand of your country, which is the happiness index, which everyone talks about. So you, uh -huh. do you have anything to comment on that? Because I think everyone looks at your country with that happiness index. Uh, yes, uh, in fact, uh, that uh, idea is already in the process. While we still are working on this uh, international certification capacity, on the other side, there is also the national branding, which is the brand Bhutan that is being worked on. So with the brand Bhutan, which, what will happen is, uh, the brand will have um, not only for food, also for textiles, woodworks, the whole services, the whole range of uh, uh, things that couldn't be branded. So within that brand, Bhutan, they will have also uh, have a criteria to be met. So under that brand, Bhutan, uh, we are looking at the, uh, having any agriculture produce that are linked to the brand Bhutan should be, uh, you know, organic. So it means uh, in the future, anything that uh, may come out in the international market with the brand Bhutan would basically uh, mean that it uh, it would link to the origin uh, of uh, where the product came from, which is Bhutan, the Bhutan where people understand as the land of happiness, as well as that uh, Bhutan, which is trying to be 100% organic, so I, uh, that is basically the idea that linking the name of the country to uh, the brand Bhutan. Uh, so that work is in the process. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, another one that is for both you and uh, Dr. Yada, but maybe while he's trying to rectify, I hope Dr. Yada will come back soon. Um, there is a question regarding that, can we get the same productivity of the crop with that of the inorganic uh, by using the inorganic inputs productivity level mm. i see dr yadav is back would you like to answer that or <laughs> ah, yes. has come back. i'll let you go first okay. thank you thank you kissing i'll take it up yeah. you know uh, as far as the research part which has been done over the last 10 years it has been proven beyond doubt that organic can give this same amount of productivity, which you can get under the best management practices in the integrated areas. And even if it is, suppose if it is a rain fed area, you can get even a 25 to 30% higher productivity under the organic. But the problem is you have to shift to the organic management practices in letter and spirit. What happens, people normally grow one monocrop in the conventional and then start growing the same monocrop into the organic then certainly in such situation, your yield will go down. So you also have to, once you are shifting to organic means, shift to multiple cropping, uh, intercropping, and integrated management. If you adopt that one right from the first year itself, you can get the comparable productivity. But if you continue to grow the same monocrop, simply replacement of chemical input by organic input, you won't get that productivity. And uh, sure. Akaliji, like to also the add, earlier one. Akaliji, also, so, can I add one point to Dr. Yadav? Okay, but uh, okay. sir has not answered the first one, so we'll go oh, okay, back yeah, to you. Yeah. Ah, uh, so I'll come back to the first one. Yes, sir. 
uh, you know this uh, returnee problems everywhere if we concentrate only to the nagaland and only to the organic farming the plus point with the northeastern states including nagaland is organic farming has been promoted in a very very significant manner in your areas now you have got small small models of success in the state but all these models need lot of upgradation in the form of innovations supply chain management value additions and ensure the delivery of the material in good shape from nagaland to the other parts of the country so assistances are available but only thing is ki local support in terms of the young entrepreneurs with innovative minds is was really missing and i hope with lot of you know educated youth have come back to the rural areas i invite them to join the movement of organic there can be one input production one area where they can concentrate and can create a small small enterprises form of fertilizers organic fertilizers or it can be in the form of organic pest management or the weed management then the certificate management disease management something like that value additions we have been doing i think webinars on especially the value addition from last almost two months with many many companies offering the machines technologies now time has come you know they should also be part of all this movement and take the advantage of the situation where you can create the post harvest infrastructure in the given crop in the given quality and start managing the supply chains you know de depending producing at nagaland and giving it to somebody else to supply to some other areas is not profitable all your returnees have seen the country they know different parts of the country they may be understanding a little bit of marketing dynamics of the other states and where the demand is concentrated if they put their knowledge under the local situations i think they can come up with some innovative ideas that how they can utilize the commodities grown there in a qualitative form and can deliver directly to those people those who really need it maybe for export or maybe for a local retail chain in those big cities thank you hello sir ah uh, sir one more thing uh, yes. there is like a question that how can organic farming be the best option for sustaining huge population as well as the enhancing farmers income in india oh that's a lot big very big question yes sir <laughs> you are putting too much burden on organic <laughs> you know this is a very big question you know with the growing population persons increasing and the land mass is decreasing really it becomes very difficult the only option if we can go through organic is increase productivity and increase market connectivity so that you can get a better value for the produce if the economics goes better i think more and more people will be certainly joining this uh i i'll come back to sandeep i'll give time later but uh, since we are with dr yadav so let me just finish this um so there is also another question uh, that mr subhash paligar who is a founder of zero budget uh, this thing uh, zpnf yeah opposes yeah. organic farming and says that the organic farming is more dangerous then the chemical farming as it contributes more to global warming so what's your view on his uh, conclusion sir just maybe a few point a few lines sir first thing what exactly is natural farming it also prohibits chemical it also depends upon the recycling of the biomass it also depends upon the local on farm resources so from all point of view natural farming is no different than the organic farming actually in his understanding what i am saying is it's not the common understanding in his understanding he thinks putting vermicompost or putting 
compost is organic farming and not putting these two three things is natural farming no natural farming what he promotes is also the organic farming what we multiple cropping intercropping use of the local resources recycling of the local biomass so that is not different he is criticizing organic farming in his own way it's okay that is his perspective i need not to go into that but for me if that area because same type of system is not successful in all the areas there are many areas in the country those who are naturally organic it's good for those areas and if peoples are able to adopt it they can get good productivity but certainly no system is applicable in a uniform manner across the country thank you sir and uh, sandeep wanted to say a few words so maybe uh, on the question that i posed to sir yadav yeah. maybe if you want to have a just few to comments, add to what dr yadav said you said about the productivity so when you look at productivity you have to also look at two aspects one there's many many i I'll, i'll talk about old research and new research the old research we have that the nutrient density in all food organic food is much higher in organic and biodynamic food compared to conventional food if you see the nutrient density how it's going down in our wheat in many of these products which are conventionally grown same time there is a lot of uh, lack of nutrient what you can get what you can get from organic food and the second thing is uh, we have this carbon climate change issue you know well organic farming is really putting the carbon back and it's uh, keeping the environment safe by not using pesticides and that is called full cost accounting or true cost accounting from fao so if you measure productivity in that sense how much water is being conserved how much land is being saved uh, from pesticide how much uh, from health issues related to pesticide and how much carbon is putting in the soil then the productivity for organic farming is much higher if you start and we are not going into soil biodiversity if we talk about the microbial activity in the soil we talk about other than the organic carbon it's much much higher in organic so if productivity taken only from one aspect i don't think it's a fair uh, comparison you should compare from all the aspects from nutrient nutrient density to soil carbon to microbes in the soil to water water conservation you know we have a big water problem everywhere in the country how can we save the water now and agriculture uses the highest water so productivity should be measured in this holistic way and not from a single facet there are a lot of questions uh, but uh, we are running short of time and therefore uh, we can uh, reply them to them in the uh, in other formats and uh, for the time being let us shift over to the um, the uh, policy issues and uh, i would like to that this policy issues which the, the, the chief secretary may like to uh, reply and after which uh, i'll request him to give a few uh, minutes of uh, some remarks from the uh, honorable chief secretary so i'll i'll leave to the i'll request akali to state those questions which the chief secretary will like to reply then if he can give some closing remarks yeah akali can you <clears throat> Uh, sir to our chief secretary um there's a question that uh, how will the organic policies in nagaland be effectively implemented because i think there are reservations about um policies being implemented um you know in time by the government so this is one comment they wanted to know the attendees and on the policies then sir uh there's also a comment which says that uh, uh, unless the policies are in place it will it will be very difficult for the farmers and the investors to come on board so this is a related question to um the policies so sir if you can kindly uh say on this and then also since you have already heard all the presentation and all the question and answer so if you can kindly give your comments on this sir thank you very much um all good questions i must say when we talk of uh, nagaland just for uh, looking at nagaland and the policy on organic farming um we prefer to go step by step much as the time has gone and uh, you know whenever we come out with any policy we grapple with the issue of the uh, the 
should I say the beneficiaries, the people for whom the policy is meant for. Uh, unfortunately, here in Nagaland, anything that comes from the government is taken with a, with a favor, and anything that comes from the government is free. Anything that comes from the government uh, need not be taken so seriously, uh, seriously, much in the form of, you know, historically we've had the uh, system of having subsidies and all that. But then, as it were, I think uh, we are uh, slowly uh, finalizing, uh, coming, coming towards finalizing the organic policy. And here we want to make it very robust. And though this is a policy of the government, the participation of the farmers, the wide spectrum of farmers that I was talking about, we need to address all of them. And uh, with the understanding, with the change in uh, attitude of our people, I'm sure uh, we will forge ahead. And at this point of time, I must say that uh, this webinar has been uh, extremely useful for me. It has been, uh, it has brought new insights and it is definitely going to uh, give that big push towards organic farming, which Nagaland so desperately needs. And I do hope, Akali, that uh, this um, webinar has been rec uh, re recorded because... Yes, sir. Yeah, that's good because I must tell you very honestly that this webinar, the moment I get the recording of this, uh, this will become a reference point, a reference point in so far as charting a future course on um, organic farming is concerned. Okay. I must thank Ms. Kassam for sharing her experiences of Bhutan. And uh, she, has, she has been very practical, realistic in setting objectives and seeing, I mean, being very uh, steady, going about it very steadily, slowly, but surely. We have a lot of lessons to be learned from Bhutan. And uh, thank you very much, Kesam. Dr. Yadav, less said the better, because I've discovered a new a storehouse of knowledge in so far as uh, agri and particularly uh, organic farming is concerned. I really, really thank you for sharing your experiences. And I do look forward to your next visit to Nagaland, where we can sit across the table and share specific issues uh, relating to the state of Nagaland. And uh, though uh, Mr. Romel, the uh, Honorable Mayor, could not uh, join us uh, because of the brownout, I'm so happy that uh, Sandeep was able to give a preview into uh, what is being done in the Philippines. A lot of lessons to be learned. I must say that uh, historically, Nagaland has gone from farms to arms. But then <laughs> I think it's about time that we reverse that and the time is coming when we need to go back from arms to farms. Along with that, the uh, returnees, the COVID, the present lockdown. I mean, globally, uh, this uh, pandemic has affected us. And sitting in this corner of India, Nagaland has also had its own experiences with COVID-19. Uh, it has brought a lot of realization into where we actually stand. You know, we really did not know that we had so many of our people working outside and who are mostly back home now. We are thinking of ways and means to train them, to skill them, to, to help them stand on their feet. And also fill in the gaps because we've had a lot of migrant workers who were in Nagaland and who have now gone back to their respective states. So uh, these are... Um, challenges that we are uh, grappling with, and I'm sure the solution will not be far. And, uh, and uh, so far as Nagaland is concerned, the road towards getting that 
organic uh, label is going to be long, but then we have to start somewhere, starting with the government departments. There has to be convergence. Uh, unfortunately, I do not see too much of convergence happening as of now, but then we will work towards that, towards involvement of our farmers, the progressive farmers, as well as the farmers in the rural areas. And also, it's not only about growing the products, but also, like uh, Dr. Yadav was saying, the marketing. I, I, I must share with you one experience uh, last week, which was uh, told to me by someone. You know, the uh, eastern part of Nagaland, the eastern districts, they produce a lot of uh, kolar, the kidney bean, which you call rajma. And uh, there's a lot of demand for it. And I said, as I said initially, we do have uh, certified uh, farmers. And what I was told was that this kolar, whether it was produced by the uh, certified organic farmers or the other farmers, these were all aggregated and sold at the same at the, at, to the same buyers. I mean, these things need to change, and then we need to. Uh, uh, to actually uh, start appreciating and letting the farmers also appreciate the difference between non-organic non and non-organic produce. So, uh, like I said, uh, I mean, the challenges are many, but we shall overcome them one by one. And then, in not too distant the future, we do hope that Nagaland will uh, turn out to be the organic hub of the region, of the country, and of uh, Southeast Asia. And with a lot of hope, I want to thank all the participants again, the panelists, uh, for sparing your time, for sharing your experiences and your knowledge with us. Like I said, this is definitely going to be useful. This webinar is going to be a turning point, and I say so with confidence, so far as Nagaland is concerned. I would also like to thank the, uh, the participants or you know, the viewers who have been uh, hanging on, listening to us. So thank you for your questions. Your questions have been very uh, meaningful, some difficult to answer maybe, but then uh, this has, uh, we do not know whether we have answered your questions uh, to your satisfaction. But then your questions have triggered our minds into you know, opening up new aspects as we travel along this uh, road, as it were, towards uh, making Nagaland into an organic state. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. More than what we expected. And now um, this, I think with the time zone, we'll have to wind it up. Uh, because I'll call you to say a few words and uh, then uh, the Secretary and okay to say the vote of thanks. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, thanks a lot to uh, Sir Temjin for giving that uh, very encouraging words. Uh, uh, there was a question uh, which we missed out and I, I'm sure they'll feel bad because we, it was both in the chat box as well as the question. So that's why I'm taking this time to just say it and if um, our Sir any one of them can answer this. What role would the NSR, NSRLM under NRLM have in the current scenario? Because this is prevalent in all the Northeast regions. So I don't know if the Sir Yada will answer it or Sir, our uh, Sir Temjin, uh, anyone can answer this. And then after that, uh, I think our secretary, NOK, will uh, wind up with a board of thanks. Oh, you can uh I think I'll take a first shot on that, on MSRLM, the livelihood missions in Nagaland. And I, I think the program is being implemented extremely well here. And in fact, the, the network of uh, self-help groups that have, uh, that have come up around this program is phenomenal. In fact, when the COVID first happened, uh, we were trying to reach out you know, messages to the, to the uh, villagers. And if we had to go through the normal route of 
uh, through the district administration and through you know various notifications. So that we did, of course, but that would take that would take time. But we were pleasantly surprised that the way the self-help groups have been networked with one SMS, all the villages could be reached. Uh, and then we made uh, a lot of good news of the self-help groups. And towards that end, I think, even towards, um, I mean, uh, promoting uh, organic farming and disseminating uh, knowledge and uh, information to the rural areas, I think this, uh, the livelihood missions would be a good platform to utilize. Thank you. Thank you very much. So all good things must come to an end. And now I'll request uh, Secretary Enoke to give the word of thanks. And after that, we shall close this webinar. <clears throat> Thank you very much, all <laughs> participants. On behalf, on behalf of NOK, there's so many people to thank. Uh, but I first want to thank all, uh, all of you who have be, been able to uh, participate and be here today. And uh, I especially want to thank the Honorable Chief Secretary Chagolin. We thank you, sir, for uh, providing us such valuable insights into the present uh, scenario of the organic uh, farming in the state. And uh, we also thank you and, uh, for your support and presence which has been truly encouraging. And we thank Dr. Eki Yadav and Ms. Kezang Tsomo. Uh, we are really privileged to have you here to share your uh, views, information, and learnings. And we have all benefited immensely by your presence here. And uh, we are very sad and it was very unfortunate that Mayor Ro Rommel could not be with us, but uh, uh, we thank, uh, Mr. Sandeep Kamat, that uh, he was able to take uh, his place and share his uh, presentation with us. And we also want to thank, especially thank uh, Mr. Sandeep for his invaluable assistance to NOK and to the series of webinars that we have had. And he's been very uh, helpful uh, and uh, his uh, assistance has been very instrumental to the success of our uh, webinar series. And uh, finally, we uh, draw close to this final session of our webinar series. Uh, we are sad to say that this is the last uh, session that we are gonna have for a while, but we will be sure to update all of you for, uh, we have, we'll be sure to update you on the future uh, webinar sessions that we will have in, Okay, so we'll be sure to inform all of you, uh, update you on future sessions that you plan to have. And uh, once again, we just thank all the uh, participants for being uh, available today so that you can interact and uh, uh, be online with us to uh, come and learn and share your questions as well. And once again, we just thank you Okay, and of course, there's a few questions which have not been answered, which uh, we will be emailing to the panelists and we will get a uh, respond through email to uh, provide the answers to the questions that have been provided. Uh, so thank you once again for everybody and we wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khalif. Thank you so much, sir, for coming, sir. Hope to see you in Nagaland soon, sir. <laughs> yeah. And Madam Kesan, I hope to see you in Nagaland soon. I hope yeah. so. <laughs> we hope we can travel there, and I hope you yeah. all visit Bhutan too. Yes. 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 <laughs> we'll definitely do that. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Okay, nice meeting all of you. It was yes. wonderful. Same here. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>